You ever, I don't know, just a question I was thinking about a minute ago because I've become uh, wonderfully jaded where I've been able to do so many cool things that that's a blessing, but some things I take for granted Mm -hmm. because we do them all the time. We live here in a town with a lot of cool people, some people not cool, but generally it's, it's, you know, you get to see and be around really cool things. We did a show last night at the Ryman and Creed came out, Scott Stapp came out and played with us. We did Hire and we did My Sacrifice and it was awesome. And it's one of those rare moments where I was like, like, this is cool. This is nuts, yeah. Yeah, this is cool. And Michelle Branch and the Wreckers came out. They were so cool to come out and play with us. And there were a couple instances where I was like, I don't get to do this very often, but, like, I'm enjoying this moment yeah. that is co- way cooler than I am. Do you have that at all now? Yeah. When does that happen to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've i I've always been pretty good about that, like, enjoying it while it's happening and recognize, like, I remember in college, I was, like, laying in the bed in the dorm room. Like, I don't know, I just, and I thought to myself, like, man, you're never going to do this again. This is cool. So I've always had that. As in in college it. playing ball and stuff or college yeah. experience or what? Just the experience. Like, man. What about this... now that you, you I mean you have all these hits and you, yeah. you're selling out these shows just musically? Do you ever, are you ever in a room with somebody and they just pick up a guitar or you're, I don't know, just yeah, something I'll... happens now with all of your success where you're still like, huh, okay, this is cool again. Yeah, 100%. Like Garth Brooks went mm-hmm. out with him at Nissan Stadium. Chesney brought me out last year at uh, in Bozeman, Montana. And I'm just, I was just here hanging out with my buddies. We were, I was in my fishing clothes. like. But stuff like that happens all the time still. Um, even making this this last record, I'm sitting in there like Lee Bryce came over. Uh, down in Mexico, I was just with Luke. So, yeah, a lot of stuff has been happening where I'm like, oh, yeah, 100%. I'm like, dang, this is real life for me. Uh, but at the same time, I, I still don't appreciate it as much as I should. I agree. And I also sometimes I'm driven by it, but also sometimes I have like this, and not last night specifically because it was a big charity deal I put together, but sometimes I'm driven by it. But sometimes, honestly, it makes me insecure too. I'm like, why am I not like at this level, yeah. at, you know, where I look out and I'm like, dang, like what's, maybe, I, I don't know. It's like, it's a good check for me. Yeah. But there are some of those instances too where I'm like, dang, like maybe I got to go harder. Yeah. I think there's, uh, I think there's health behind recognizing that it's cool and awesome at the same time for me i'm the same way like i'm not selling out bridgestone yet jelly roll just did like what the hell has he done that i haven't and then in the days just been himself more like there's music's better i don't know what it is but i've gotten a place now where i'm at least grateful to like to for them yeah i'm happy for them but i'm not i'm not happy with where i am in my career um now that with this picture, it also represents kind of the new record. I'm happy with what that record is, and if that fails, I'll be pissed. But I wouldn't change it, so that's a good place to be. Yeah, and you can be pissed though, honestly. Yeah. Because you, by the way, I have had two or three people that have to, have talked about your record to me randomly, like didn't really? bring it up. Where it was like, hey, have you heard Chase's record? And I'm I don't really talk about music. Yeah. I'm. I get that. Just generally. Yeah. But a couple, maybe two, or I think it was three. Two brought it up specifically, and one was talking about something they were listening to, and they were like, the Chase record. It was the Jordan Davis and the Chase record. They brought both of them up. And they were like, the Chase record is different. Mm-hmm. And it was that, that, that sonically it was different, and that it felt like you were a little more, I don't want to say honest, because I think your, your story is whatever you're telling at the time. Yeah. It's not a lie if yeah. you're not going deeper places. Mm-hmm. It's still the truth. It's just the truth. Yeah. They were like, it just felt more honest. Yeah. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I don't think what I always did was a lie for sure. But I think I, I, was, I agree, by the way. That's why I said that. It yeah. wasn't a lie. But I was just I was confused. Like I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't know what I didn't know what I wanted to do or didn't want to do. I was just like, yeah, whatever's working. Um at the same time, I I knew deep down, I was like, what are you doing, man? Like, there's something better you can do. And that was a big part of that was Oscar came in. And he sat Oscar Charles. Oscar. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, he's an awesome producer. Produced the whole album. Did it in my house. And this one was like, I wrote the songs different, which that process was just me and a guitar for the most part and then other writers, but I had no tracks. Like, I, I don't know, it just helped me write more real stuff. Um, and then the coolest part was him working. We were helping pick songs. And one song I wanted to do, and it kind of reminded him of some of the older stuff. And he was like, I'm going to be straight up with you, man. You're better than that. And when he said that, I was like, damn, that's like, it's a good thing to hear. It's like it hurts, but the net gain yeah. is significant. Signi- yeah, it's a good, yeah. good way of putting it. Yeah, it was like, damn, yeah, you're right. Okay. And I trusted, and we learned to trust each other throughout that process. But 
Yeah, I, uh, this it's more honest for sure. I touched a lot of stuff that I've never touched before with depression and, and addiction and whether it's me or my friends or whatever. But um, I think a lot of it was just the songs were written a different way and then having Oscar on there to to help me not chase what's popular, to help me just chase what's best for me. Do you feel like I'm going to assign a theory, tell you, tell me if I'm wrong or not. When you started here, what, what, what was the year you think you started in Nashville? It's all blurry to me. 2010 was when I moved here. So When did yeah. you have your first hit? What year? 12 with Cruz. Yeah. <laughs> just like, God dang. So do you feel like that success just kind of came so fast that you didn't have time to kind of figure out exactly who you were as an artist, meaning you were already off and running with success, and you're like, well, this is successful. I'm just going to keep going with this. 100%. That's exactly what happened. And then, it, But it was Cruz, and FGL would have never happened without Joey Moy. Like, those guys had a thing that worked for them. They had a process. I didn't have a process. It was like, Cruz, okay, that's cool. Let's rewrite it with Ready, Set, Roll. When I listen to Ready, Set, Roll, I'm like, I would never write that today. Those words would never, like, slide girl by my side girl is never happening again. Um, but, but that, that was, was a thing. That was a thing at mm-hmm. the time, for sure. Um, the problem with Cruz and what that started was it started everybody trying to do it in a shittier way and just a not as good version. And that's what I was doing. What, what do you mean by that? Um, I've never asked you about the Cruz situation. Yeah. And I don't even know if it's a situation. You hear things about the writing of it. Yeah. Pe- playing it. Just whatever you're comfortable with sharing. Like, what? what is that? Because I, I literally don't know the story. Yeah. And I was never really close to those guys. Yeah. And actually, we had some pretty bad falling outs a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, when they, when they would talk you. crap about me out of nowhere. And I'm like, all right, boys, you want to go? Let's go. <laughs> and I'm in like a handicap match in wrestling. It's like two on one. But yeah. okay, if that's what we're going to do, let's do it. And we've fixed it and gone back and fixed yeah. it. But whatever. Yeah. I feel. but So I've never even asked anyone about that. What do you say about that now? It, well, it was written. Originally, it was me, Brian, Kelly, and Jesse Rice in a room. And we were writing with guitars. Um, writing a slow song called When God Runs Out of Rain, which is still a cool title. Um, I was going to say, I don't know that. Is that out? No, we never finished it. We finished it, but we never That's, that's a cool concept. A cool title. Yeah. We probably need to rewrite it. But um, Then Brian started Cruz, and it was just like, baby, you like a song. We wrote it in like 45 minutes. Then they did like a garage band work tape to it. Nothing special, but I don't know. That was when tracks were starting in Nashville. Yeah, so it's it was like, like Apple yeah, let's build a track. Yeah, right, got it. Which is the last thing Joey Moy really needed. But, um, and then they were in the studio and Joey and Tyler, they did change a good bit. So whatever they changed, they added bridge, they added a lot of parts. So they changed a lot. So they were added as songwriters later, which happens all the time. Wait, so they weren't songwriters initially? They weren't in the room initially. Got it. And then, but they did, I will say, they changed enough to where they should have been songwriters. Is that one of those things they call and go, hey guys, is it cool if we change this? Yeah, we got an email from Seth. Um, so yeah, he 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 approved it before. Like, and at that time, I'm like, I don't care. Like, mm-hmm. nobody's gonna hear this song. Who cares? Because I'm thinking like a new band, not signed, not signed. Right. Nobody's gonna care. Um, I was way off on that. Obviously, looking back. <laughs> but, um, but no, they they uh, they were added on the song of songwriters too. So, um, and, and I'll be the first to say, like, people ask me all the time, like, if I are you, am I mad? I didn't record that. I'm like, no. It so you never, never thought, happened. I never even, I wasn't even asked, I didn't know. Was it written in the room for whomever? It was, we wrote a lot for me, me, Brian, and Jesse. Um, but that day, to, or Brian immediately was like, man, this is huge for FGL. Okay. He was, he was kind of led the charge on that one immediately. But I don't know how he led it with Tyler and Joey and that team, but um, he led the charge on this is huge for FGL, and he was not wrong. So when they record it, and it, I wasn't in Nashville yet, so I missed that pop with that song. When it came to me, I was I was doing hip hop and pop still, and the Nelly version had yeah. been crossed over. So that's where it was introduced to me, but yeah. if it's crossing over to pop, it had to be a monster here in Nashville. Yeah. What was it like then for you as a writer? Was it good with you guys? Cuz you all wrote it together or did it get weird at all? Uh on my side it wasn't weird until later, and I'll get to that in a second, but it was uh I was loving it. Because I'm sitting there like, dang, this is easy. Like, I didn't know songwriting would be so easy. I didn't know success in Nashville would be so easy um, since that's obviously changed. But um, Brian would keep me updated on the road because we lived together. So he would be coming home from, like, the Willie Nelson tour or something like that that they were on. They were exploding. Like, it was – but in my mind, I saw that, and I was like, damn, this would be easy for me to do too, um, which was the bad mindset to have, but I didn't know any better. Um 
yeah, I was always coming home like Brian. I'm, I think it was in the 30s, and he looked at me and he was like, "Dude, this is gonna be our first number one, no problem. It's, it's gonna happen." He was so confident about. It. I'm like, oh, "Okay, cool." I don't think I didn't know how big it was gonna be. Um, Did you? Were you making any money then at all doing anything? No, because no. again, that's you know, obviously it's one. I'm assuming one six publishing at that point with six writers, unless they got funky with the with the percentages, which they don't always do here. No, I owned all my publishing. I, own, I still own all my publishing. On so, but, you, but I'm saying when you wrote it, there were six writers. So, you, so one six of the writing part of it. Yeah. So, how long until you start to get residuals off that? A year or so? There's yeah, it'll be five writers. Um. Oh, fi- okay, who did I miss? Oh, I'm, oh, Joey. When Joey and Tyler went back in. Right. Got it. So there's five writers. Uh huh. Um. No, they 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 did a ev- they did an equal split of as far or they did a they did a proper split where it was uh just twenty 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 twenty. They didn't they, the- they didn't do that. No, they they didn't take all of our stuff. They added Joey and Tyler on a different a smaller percent. Oh oh, well, that's okay. Yeah, it was awesome. That they, is yeah. they did it right. Yeah, that is right. Okay. Um, and then it just started blowing up. So that I knew I at least had money coming in. I finally had money coming in because I was about out of money to the you know the point you're like. 26, 27, yeah. like, mom, I need some money. Like, reality it's, sets in about that point. Your dreams place. that you've been chasing are like, oh, crap. Now I got to yeah. figure out how to support. So that was always, that was huge, like, not having to worry about, okay, now I, now I don't have to get a real job. You know, I can keep writing songs. At the same time, I was wanting to rewrite that. Or I wasn't really wanting to rewrite it. I just wanted to have that success. Um which is the main reason it led to me going down that bro country road, which is what it was called, and there's a proper name for it. Um, but at the time, it, it took a second to get labeled that, honestly. Yeah, yeah. It was just what was popular. Yeah. And you were you were a writer of the biggest song of a decade. Yeah. I would feel the same way. Like, I just did this. This is what's popular. It was that easy. Let's go. Yeah, a perfect example of what you should do in that scenario, which I'd tell any young writer, like right now it's Wallen and Zach Bryan, which is kind of cool because it's two very different things that are – the top of country but a perfect example of one thing i look back i'm like dang he did it right was sam hunt he didn't go down that road he didn't go down the bro country thing um he created his i kept hearing like he's creating his own thing he's creating his own thing then it, he puts it out and explodes um so that was a good example of what i wish i would have done differently back then but same thing i didn't know i wish i would have focused on more writing with me and a guitar stop the track thing that's not really my thing but at the same time looking back now it, you've it learned was. yeah but, yeah i mean now you've actually Maybe you wouldn't have got to this place now without all of doing it wrong. Yeah. And by doing it wrong, you still did it right. I mean, I wrote a whole book on— I would all, even say I did it wrong, though. Uh, but, so, yeah. but now, because you're doing it right, you know you did it wrong. Right. I, did a whole, I wrote a whole <laughs> book called Fail Until You Don't, which I screwed yeah. up everything. And I'm, I got fined a million bucks by the FCC a few years ago, and I'm really embarrassed of it. And really one of the things I wish I could take back. But I don't have a lot of regrets yeah. even in the things that I messed up because I've taken something from them. And I feel like now you're at that place where you've taken so much from— I'm not even gonna say mistakes, but yeah. a, a, a different version of you. Yeah. That it's making you probably a better version than you would have been anyway. That's true. Artistically. Yeah, I would say so. Well, now I definitely know what I don't want to do. Like that's when you're in that that spot in a room when you're writing, you can look at the guy square in the eye and be like, "No, we're not saying that." Mm-hmm. If you want to write for somebody else, go ahead. But I'm not, I'm not gonna waste my time with that because I know it'll be a waste of your time too. Um. So now I know in a room what I want to write and what I don't want to write. Um. Bow that story up on uh, the. Because I have so much to talk about, and that's my fault for, for turning You're the good. different direction. But bow that story up on, uh, what's, what's the FGL song called? Cruise? Um, yeah, Cruise. Sorry, yeah. Your song, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Bow that. I was up till like 3 in the morning, and then I got Very up good. at 4 o'clock to the radio show. So not all the synapses are firing exactly right. But, yeah, so finish that story. Yeah, so that was blowing up. Um, and while they were exploding, there definitely started becoming some tension. Uh and I don't even want to hammer on that because we've gotten over it. We're good now. But there was some tension for sure with Tyler basically called me out on trying to be FGL. And looking back, I'm, I would look him square in the eye and be like, you were right. Like, But also you created something that, Yeah, I'll say this. You didn't say this to me. My theory is, and it could be wrong, you helped create that brand with that song that helped create that brand that was that band. I would say I'm a very, very small part of that, though. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, great. But I was part of it. Absolutely. Um, and I would look at them now and just be like, dude, you guys were a huge, you were a big inspiration for me because I, you're the only guys that I, that accepted me, to be honest. Um, and so they, I learned a lot from them. I learned a ton about songwriting. And they're, I don't care what you say about Brian and Tyler. They're good writers. And they're, and they're 
good artists. And they're Don't say right. that to me. I'm not saying anything about them. No, no, I know. Yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't saying. You know, I mean, I'm just saying. I said saying, plenty about them. But I'm good. We're all good now. They yeah. get a lot of shit yeah. talking about them. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Those guys yeah. are talented, man. Yeah, for, um, for sure. But I learned everything from them. And it, it's it's cool, man. Looking back, because I learned so much, and I went down those roads with Ready Set Roll, and that whole that Ignite the Night album was platinum. And I'm like, God, what? There's a moment you have when you're a new artist that you can never get back, and that was my moment. And I'm like, damn, I wish I wish I would have taken more time to step back, not put out music, and write and figure out who I was and what I really wanted to do. The problem was I didn't have anybody to lead and guide me. Like Eric Church had Jay Joyce. Um, every you can point it at a lot of artists who have their producer. I didn't have a full time producer on any of my stuff. So isn't it weird? You said you had your platinum album, and you're like, cringe face. It's your, you said platinum album. Uh, I mean, yeah, I get it, but it's I, I just that's it's a, that was a major success. Right now, I'm battling against myself. Yeah, which is crazy because but it's it's a pretty easy battle now. It's like if you don't trust it or believe it, that's cool. I'm, I'm not I'm not changing what I'm doing now. Like. I know where I am now, and I'm good with it. I think that the really cool end of this story is, I think you're, and I could be wrong, but I think your most recent number one was the Drinking Beer Talking God Amen with FGL. It's a book end. Yeah, so I mean, and yeah. th- that was the point I was going to get to is, I mean, you go through seasons. If you're close to people, it doesn't matter who it is, family member, best friend, like, you're not really close unless you also get into it a little bit. Because if you're that yeah. close all the time, there will be tension. It doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, Mike goes everywhere with me, and Eddie and... We're so close. Yeah. Every once in a while, you get into it, it flares up. Yeah, because we're just freaking humans. And the end of this version is you're, that last number one song. Those guys are on it with you. I know. It's and, and that was their last one of their. I don't know what they had as, as you know as FGL, but um, we never even talked about it either. There was so much tension and it blew up in our face that we just didn't talk for years. But that also pushed me to go figure out my own thing. And then we were in Australia. In a parking lot after we literally a hotel parking lot after we'd done a show in Australia and we just started hanging out again. We just we had a night, we were never drinking. addressed it. You're just like never talked. Uh, game about on. It. It's never. like Wayne's World. Game we're on. Good. Game on. I think I think we're just it, so cool. much time had passed. Um Yeah, we're, we were good after that. And then Tyler and I have a lot of real conversations even now. Like we're just I don't know, we can just go deeper than we used to be able to. Like I listened to his whole record in his truck. Um, and I played him five or six of mine, and we just had a good day. Like, I don't know. We just never had to talk about it. It was just water under the bridge at that point. I credit Tyler, too, a bit for, because Tyler and I, for some reason, he went after me once on Sirius, and I was like, what's <laughs> happening right now? And I was like, all right, like, I'll mix it up. I do not care. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like I'm a little more mature. I look back at some of the stuff I did, and yeah. I was like, oof, I yeah. wish I wouldn't have done that. Because there's definitely some feuds I went after too hard, too yeah. aggressively. Because I, insecure, I was insecure, so it was yeah. like, you're going to hit me. I got to hit you back 10 times so people don't think I'm weak. And yeah. I wish I didn't have that mindset. But that's what I would do. And we we went into it hard. And then it was just the o- occasional run-in. It was awkward, but a little less awkward, a little less awkward, a little less awkward. And I was at a place where I was struggling big time. And I talked to Dave Haywood from Lady A, who I really like because he's very analytical, but he's also super creative, yeah. some, somewhere that I have to be. And he's like, hey, you should, do, you should go to on-site. And then I met Tyler for coffee. Oh, and, yeah. And, again, Tyler and I hadn't got along for a long time. And then it was less and less awkward, but we still weren't boys. And he was like, hey, man, like, I know we haven't been super cool, but if we're both willing to sit down here, like, we're very like-minded. This is why this place – and he just – we just had a real, like, real talk. Yeah. And I went, like, two days later. And, like, I credit him to go for going for, like, six days, which I never do. I can't get away from work. I'm obsessed. I'm afraid if I fail, I'm done. Yeah. Like, I don't have the – I don't have any security in my mind. Yeah. I'm the same way a lot. So I went, and that's like, that that was like that's a real it's thing huge. from that dude. Yeah. Who in the play part of this world, we were fighting like crazy, but like in the human part, once you like get back yeah. down and just sit down and look at each other in the eye, it's like the, I had the same thing with Kip Moore. We got into a big fight. Really? Yeah. And Kip was like, "Let's just have breakfast," and I was like, "All right," and we did. We've been a plus ever since because the human part of it, right, takes yeah. over. But so long we avoid that because mm-hmm. we're like we're pissed. You know, we don't want, so it's cool that you guys just played a show together in Australia. Yeah. And then I got up in St. Cruz when that, they asked me to. So were, yeah. you surpri- were you surprised? Oh, yeah. Like, really? Okay. That's so legit. That um, that's how it happened. Like, human mm-hmm. made that happen again. And that all led to drinking beer, talking, got him in, which is once again, that was Brian kind of leading the charge. Like, hey, man, we should do this together. Um, it was a very, and that was in 2020. So it was 2010. To, that was 10 years later. It was like, all right, we're done with this. Um, 
I'm done being part of anything that really has anything to do with FGL. Um, they're done with each other right now, it seems like. No, it seems like. Oh, they are. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, know. What, I don't they know if they're coming me. back. No, no, well, they may come back, but it's only going to be if like Rascal Flats come back and like we miss <laughs> having crowds, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they're going to do solo wise, but um, it was a cool book in, and it was like it was like I don't know. I think 2020 was a reset for the whole world. Agree. Like, I was like, dang, mm-hmm. okay, now you, you either came out worse or came out better. For me, as a person, as a uh, as an artist, came out better. I'm curious with the new record. Did you do anything different recording wise? I know you had a new producer, but did you go into one of the big Nashville studios? Did you what did you do? Because even the sound of it's a bit grittier, and that's yeah. a compliment, by the way. Yeah, I love it. So it's this, even the sound of it's a bit grittier. So what did you do recording wise different that you hadn't done before? Um, I actually do have pictures. Um, no, we went into my house. Um, literally like fire play, like drums in front of the fireplace. Uh, I did some vocals in my closet, like that. Was rough. that purposeful? Like, we want to make this get down and dirty so the music sounds like that, too? Uh, I think it was just for fun. Oscar. Really? It wasn't Oscar, a big intention. It was just Not like, really. Like, Oscar, like, we never worked together. Um, he asked me where I'd want to record. I was like, man, I just don't want to do the studio thing. I've done that for years. I just want to get a little more creative. Like, this is a shot of us in my bedroom. And that's us. Uh, that's literally sitting on the bottom part of your bed. Yeah. Around different, I'm gonna put this up to the camera. Read if yeah. you want. It's literally just like that's Barton from Boy Named Banjo, camera, yeah. Jackson Freeze in there, and we're just going over how we're gonna record. I think it was walk, walk Alone, and that's how rough and raw it was. And it, I, Oscar spun around in his chair when we were talking about where we're gonna record it and just kind of looked up in my house. He was like, What's wrong with this? I was like, mm-hmm. Damn, okay, we're on the same page. It probably was now. the vibe of the music, too. He's like, We're trying to, we're, yeah. we're chasing something, right? 100%. I loved his Circles EP from Boy Named Banjo. Didn't even know he produced it. I loved the EP before. So when I started talking to him, I immediately, tr- I had trust in him because I'd, I'd heard his work that I loved. So when he turned around and looked at my house, it was like, okay, this I've always wanted to do something crazy like this. Mm-hmm. I was thinking like go out to Montana. That'd be a lot of work. Um, we have this huge space right here. Let's use it. It's like Montana though, honestly. I it kind of is. Yeah, I, mean- <laughs> I mean, that's what I want it to be. <laughs> But it's here in Tennessee, and it worked perfect because the musicians could come in, and we'd work till sometimes we work till three, four in the morning. Um, song called Oklahoma. That was the only night session we did with them, and it, the, you can tell, you can tell a difference in it. It just has a vibrier thing to it. Um, but that's probably we we did Key West in Colorado with a click. It felt good. Then we moved on to All Dogs Go to Hell, and Oscar looked at me and said. Let's uh let's try it without a click. See how it feels. We did it and it felt awesome. So we went back and re-recorded Key West without really? a click. The whole record has no click. That was me and Oscar just kind of loving the idea of it. The musicians didn't love it at first, especially Fred the drummer. He's like, come on, man. Like, it's easier for him to have a click, but it had a whole vibe to it without it. So we just kept going with it. Um, for for those listening that aren't yeah. familiar with what a click is, so it just so whatever the. Yeah. the so that's Metronome. constant in the ears of the person, so they it helps it stay, stay on precise. Yeah. Pre- so, but when you remove the click, although it could be a little, well, we use the word sloppy, but yeah. it could be a little sloppier. It's also way more organic and yeah. way more vibey and yeah. s- a little more soulful. Yeah. So it's like take take one, give one. Yeah. But depending on what you're pursuing, we were pursuing a raw as possible. I think Oscar and he would have to speak to this more than me. He knew he got to know me pretty quick because I was just I don't know we just. He he had something about him where I could be myself. And he got to know me really quick, and he knew how raw and real I wanted this, so he kind of led the charge on, all right, let's get the click out of there. Let's make it – if you really want to change what you're doing, let's really change it. And it was – man, it was just so much fun. It was We did it for fun. We had the most fun I've ever had recording. Um, like, we wouldn't even know what songs we were recording the days of. We knew Key West and Colorado and, and All Dogs Good Hell. After that, I we didn't know what really what we were going to record. And Was there ever those nights or days where you look and you're like, dang, it's already 6 o'clock? But, like, you were into it so much. Oh, yeah. Like, I call it, like, a Vegas day. Or there's yep. no clocks in there. Yep. So unless you're, like, watching your phone, you don't know what time it is. We had a lot of – almost every day was like that because it was such a fun process. I can't ex- – like, it was just, like, this is – I don't like, – and it, that was a moment, like, you talked about earlier. Like, you're sitting there like, man, this is really happening. That was a moment for me, like – uh, we're never going to record like this again. First album together in my house. Like, it'll never happen again. Let's have the most fun we possibly can with it. That was a cool moment. I want to know about your dad. 
Yeah. And I just want to like get into this a little bit. Yeah. It, you know, I I've seen on your Twitter a bunch of pictures of him over the years, and just you posting, and I mean, you guys look alike. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's your dad. He's on the cover of the album, and you told me on the radio show why. But I, let's let's get into it. Your mm -hmm. dad was what kind of guy? As a kid, what kind of guy was your dad? Um, he was tough, tough as hell. I mean. You didn't want to piss him off. You knew that right away. Um, but he'd deal with it right away, and he'd, he'd sit you down, talk to you, or he'd spank you or whatever way he wanted to go about it. Um, but he was also, he always encouraged us to, we lived in a farm, so he'd also encouraged us to just go out and have fun, like be kids. He always, he loved us more than anything, and that showed. He never missed games. He was he was coach of a lot of our teams. Um, and he just, he was always there which is a crazy thing to say and be surprised by because now I'm realizing that's not normal for a lot of people. Um, he was always there, never missed anything. Um, and he was a kid at heart. I, I, I don't know. He's just something about us. He just – he put us first in life. And now I'm realizing, like, how hard that is yeah. to do. So I, I definitely probably never gave him the credit he deserved. But he was tough as hell. He was honest. He didn't, he didn't BS anybody. Um but that's the number one thing I would say is he loved the hell out of us and he was always there. What values do you feel as you get to be an adult and you know that he instilled in you? Because, mm -hmm. again, sometimes it takes maturation in us to realize why we matured, how we matured, and yeah. what was passed down to us. What do you think he put in What he, the values he instilled in you? Well, I know for one thing, like, I've noticed around me sometimes people are just, like, kind of nervous sometimes. And I, I learned that from him. I got that from him, whatever it was. Like, I'm very direct to the point. I hate wasting time on BS. You're also a physically imposing guy. Right. Was he? He was, yeah. He was even bigger than I am. But, like, I'm six foot, six one, depending on what shoes I've got, yeah. you know, J1's on. I'm six two. Is that right? But you're a big dude, and I can understand people will be like, oh, okay. And I just, I'm, I'm in my head so much thinking, and that's just how I am a lot of the time, that, that I'm not, it might seem like I'm just not paying attention to you, and I might not be, but I'm just not at it because I don't like you. Right. Or I don't want to be around you. I'm just, like, thinking about something. Um... But he was imposing? But he was very imposing. He walks in a room, he know, you know. Um, the thing about it is the more success I've had, the more I walk into a room and I want to disappear. I'm like, I don't, God, I don't, I don't want this attention. Um, but then you also walk in a room where you're with somebody else that's getting more, and you're like, what the hell? You're like, yeah, what? what? I, I, I do good sense. stuff, too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? It makes zero sense. It's the you creative you psyche. Have, we're, we're, we have to be weirdos to even pursue uh -huh. something creative. Uh-huh. But that yeah. doesn't mean we're not weirdos once we actually start to have success in it. We're the same weirdo. Makes you even weirder. It's just, ab like. absolutely, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so, what year did he pass away? Uh, 2008. And what did he die from? He had melanoma. He, my mom found a spot, in his, or I guess he found a spot first. They had it checked out, um, and they said it was ingrown hair. You don't need to worry about it. They cut it out anyway. Wow. They called him the next they misdiagnosed day. misdiagnosed it? Yeah, but they called him the, oh, it got too, it. They called got him the next day and said, hey, you need to come back in. So stage four melanoma. So he was fighting that his, you know, for, I don't know when he got that. I was in high school. Um, how hard was that for you? And did he let you know how hard it was for him? He didn't let us know him? how hard it was for him. Like, he'd come home with a scar. He'd be like, oh, I got another one cut out. I'm good. It's like, dang, looking back on him, he it beat the hell out of him. Um, it wasn't, I didn't let it affect me that much because because he didn't, he was like, yeah, I'm going to be dealing, seven days before he died, he said, I'm going to be dealing with this the rest of my life. I just got it checked in D.C. or Baltimore. Um, and they said, I'm pretty much good to go. But, you know, I'll, I'll, it'll come back and I'll deal with it. But by the time I'm 75, 80 years old, I'll be ready to go. And then seven days later, he was dead. Was he protecting you with that? Yeah, 100%. He knew. I look back now, and, and I've heard now from my mom, they said he only had five years left, and I had no clue. Um, and I'm not mad at him for that. I get it. I, I might do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's him protecting yeah. his kid, kids, you know? Yeah. And, and so what happened was I just went and got my heart checked, and I spent all this money to, like, do it right. And my mom asked me why I did that. I'm like, well, Mom, Dad had a heart attack. I want to make sure she – and I just found this out two Your weeks ago. Your dad had ago. a heart attack. He had a heart attack. So he had cancer. So I found – and I knew he had a heart attack from the get-go, but I found out two weeks ago when I told my mom about getting mine checked. She said, Chase, you didn't have to do that. He didn't have heart disease. He had melanoma. They, mm. that they couldn't cut out by his heart, and that ended up giving him the cardiac arrest. Did you? How did your heart turn out? It was perfectly good. Yeah, it was cool to hear that, but now looking back, I'm like, damn, it, I, I didn't yeah. have to spend all that money. But it's good to still know. 
Um, How was the relationship at like these awkward years for a kid, 12, 13, 14 with you and him? Um, it was awesome, but I don't know. I, I feel like I missed out on him getting me, us getting to know each other's men. Um, but he, it was, it was good. Um, he was always pushing me. He was proud of me. That was the biggest thing that I could take from, from one of the biggest things is that he was, he was proud of me and always told me that he always told me to love me, but he, he saw me go from, you know, middle school. I was kind of a mess because I learned about a bunch of stuff that you shouldn't learn about from a friend. Like sex stuff or drug sex stuff? stuff. Yeah, it. sex stuff and alcohol. Um, and there's a right way to go learn that, and there's a wrong way, and it, it's a, it affects me still. Um, so he caught me doing a bunch of that stuff. Um, thought I was good, but I don't know. We just never had a good talk about it like we should have. Um, but we were good. Like I don't know. I guess he probably he didn't know how to go about that. He didn't know how to go about his his eighth grade kid like getting into that type of stuff. Like that's a problem. Um, and I wish, you know, looking back that he would have taught me more about it and do how to go about it the right way than the way I learned it. Um, and that, later in life, I've, I've gone through a lot of therapy and, and I've learned from other people like, damn, that happens to a lot of people. Um, a credit to your dad. And I'm sure you, you feel this way and you love him, but it is, you're right. It is so rare for someone to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Like, and when you talk about him, you're like, he was there. Yeah. I mean, that alone mm -hmm. is pure love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It just feels like in relationships, no matter what it is, if it's parent, brother, sister, best friend, work, like everybody's going to do things and mess up and do great. It's just the, yeah. the value of, mm -hmm. of two humans working together. And, yeah. but man, consistency, mm -hmm. that's as much love as you could possibly get. Like, yeah. I, I'm, that, that's, he says, just sound like the greatest dude. Yeah, he was there. That's, that's the number one. But it wasn't like he was just there and absent. He was there and yeah. he, he gave you all the attention. Um, and then, like, through high school and stuff, met, didn't miss any of the games. Do you, um, do you he, still miss him? Oh, yeah. All the time. When did, because my mom died mm, 10, maybe 13 or so years ago. My grandmother raised me, adopted me for a while, too. And I have moments in waves where I'll, like, see something. It doesn't have to be, but it just reminds me. And it's like, oh, it's like I get kicked in the, like, side. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, man, I really miss. Yeah. What is it for you? Sometimes, I was reading a book this morning, and it was talking about dreams. It was this psychiatrist book. Um, it was talking about the dreams this one one of her patients had. And that's the best way I can explain, like, when it does kick you on the side, you're just like, damn, it comes out of nowhere, too. Where all of a sudden, you're back, you remember the phone call. I remember the phone call from my mom, Chase. She said my name. It was real shaky. And I shut the fridge. Like, I remember details. Shut the freezer. And uh, she's... I said, oh, God. My first thought when she said my name and it was shaky was, oh, God, what has she found out that I've done? Like, that's a guilty conscience right there. Um, and then she said, Chase, come home. Dad died. And I'm just like, whoa, what? Like, the only way I know how to explain it is the worst dream you ever had in your life to where it's, it's that nightmare where you wake up and you're like, oh, what, what was that real? Okay, no, that wasn't real. Thank God that wasn't real. Like, that, that would end your life if that was real. It would end life as you know it anyway. But it's that, and it's real, and then it doesn't stop. And for the next few hours, you're still processing what just happened. And I was driving home, like, where you drive from Nashville? Chapel back Hill. To I lived in Chapel. I was in college, so I was driving from Chapel Hill to Asheville. Got it. First phone call I made was my ex girlfriend, who was like my high school girlfriend, so she knew him really well. Um, called her, told her. I don't remember how that conversation went. Um. My brother, Casey, and I talked three times on the drive home. And it was more just like, what's going on? Because I didn't ask how he died. He had a heart attack, but I didn't know that. In my mind, he fell off the roof or something I, working on the house. Um, so that whole drive was just like, it, it take I, sometimes, like, this morning it didn't happen, but sometimes it'll hit you. Like, you'll be back in that place where your mom calls you, and it hits you like a ton of bricks, and your life just stops. And you're back in that moment. It's uh, even if it's for a split second, but you're just back there, and it's a, it's a shit feeling. Um, but I have done a lot of work um, talking to people, therapy stuff. Like I went to rehab twice, and the first time I went, I was like, I I didn't talk about anything that I thought I was gonna. You go back into all this stuff, mm -hmm. which is awesome. You now looking back, I'm like, okay, that's so necessary. But I dealt with the loss of him a lot, but it's still never. It's never gonna go away. And you're right. First, you're right. It's not gone away at all for me, it, especially the waves. Like, it, it's not as constant. 
but yeah. the waves are equally as powerful, yeah. right? When they do come in. Yeah. Um, but also, I, I look at it as a blessing too that I get to be sad, which is a t- twisted ish way. But my grandmother was so valuable. Yeah. I had no consistency at all. You know, my dad left when I was five or six. My mom was an addict her whole life, died in the 40s. My grandma adopted me and was there. And the fact that I'm so sad and I miss her so much, like I feel very lucky that I get to be sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because she was that awesome. Yeah. That. I'm lucky that I'm sad because yeah. I could not be sad and I would have had no consistency and no love. That's a crazy, awesome way to look at it. I it's I think it's survival for me, honestly. I do believe it, but it's weird even to say out loud where it's like I feel blessed to be sad because yeah. that was the one person for me that was, she was 70, but she was right there. Yeah. So, I, you know, when I hear the stories about your dad, I'm jealous. Yeah. But I'm also super grateful that you had that this crossed my mind for sure like would you rather have and i told people all the time back then I'll, I'll still say it like i got more out of 22 years than most people get from their dad in a lifetime and i've wondered like what's harder what happened with me or never knowing him at all and i'll take what happened with me all day 10 times out of 10 yeah. absolutely yeah uh the back of your record is your dog yeah also very meaningful to you yeah <laughs> he's awesome I so <laughs> i haven't seen him like a week and this morning we oh you saw had, him today we had a morning yeah so tell me about him so he's uh he's a black lab his name's jack um i you i wanted i always wanted a dog but i wanted him for uh for like i always wanted to go bird hunting with a dog with my own dog um so that's what i've got him for and he goes to training back and forth does he point hard he's not a pointer he's a retriever though got it he's so like du- like you take him duck hunting yeah and he goes and gets it, brings this it back quick. This morning, we were on a walk, and I was throwing the thing. He was he'll go till he drops. But I – so I got him because of the song Bench Seat, um, which is on my record, which is a song about my buddy almost shooting himself. You wrote that one by yourself from my mind. Is that right? Yeah. Got it. And I wrote it in my breakfast room. And it was a third song that I wrote by myself on the record. But I'm writing this song, and I'm, in my mind, I've got a video – going through like i don't know why the whole video is in my head while i'm writing it actually helped me write the song and uh it's about my buddy who put a gun to his head and didn't pull the trigger twice thought he was a coward for not being able to do it it's like damn no that that's when you're in a bad place when you can't even see like you did the right thing man um and he didn't because his dog came up put his head on his lap Mm, he felt love right then yeah, it was. It, well, he knew he'd have to leave the dog. Like, who's going to take care yeah. of him? He might even put blood on the dog. Like, he would have made that's, a mess. And that's love from him to the dog, worrying about the dog. Yeah. And love. Wow. And he knew this dog is pretty awesome. Uh, talking about my buddy's dog. Um, but he knew what the dog was thinking. Like, don't do this. And I think the dog knew there was a problem. Obviously, maybe not cognitive thought like we have, but he knew there was something wrong. And so he came into my house and got help. And, uh, you know, just third, second or third night, I go up and flip the light on him, like, which is funny because going back to my dad, my dad caught me on the phone talking to a girl, um, saying a bunch of shit you just don't say to girls. And then at the end of the conversation, I said, I love you. Like, I, I didn't, I was clueless. You're middle school. You don't know. Uh, middle school. And he came up. This is crazy. I, I don't know if I've ever pieced this together, but he came up, flipped the light on and sat down. And I knew I was busted. It's like, oh, no. He was on the phone the whole time. Um, fast forward to my buddy. It was like I had this thing where like, I knew he was in trouble. Um, different situation. I'm not his dad. You know, I don't, it's a different situation. But I went up and f- it's, it flipped the light on and leaned against the wall and just said, what's up, dude? And he, uh, he said, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, he's like sitting up out of bed. He's trying to go to sleep. Dog was on the floor. And uh, I said, no, what's up? Why are you here? You never come. You never come to visit me like this. You don't even like. I had a show in Atlanta. You didn't even come to the show. What are you doing here? And what's because he was a dark. He was dark, and uh, he just loses it. Face gets red. Starts bawling his eyes out. Puts his hand like this, and explains how he almost shot himself. I guess two or three nights before. And that point, I'm just I'm just listening. And uh, he got the work from a lady here that I was seeing. Who was awesome. She like made it a point. Okay, I need to see him every day. Started the work then. Um, that's been years ago. That was probably 2018, 19. And then fast forward uh to 2020 sometime, and he's at my house. He's doing much better. I'm like, okay, I got my friend back. He's mm. back. And now he's doing even better. I saw him over Christmas. He's awesome, man. He just got engaged. Um 
So um, he's joking around the fire, and uh, he's like, man, bro, you should write a song about a guy driving around his truck with his dog. And I just laugh. I'm like, that's cliche, like the most cliche song you can almost write. Three days later, um, I text her, call him, and I was like, dude, I wrote it. It's not going to be what you're going to expect. Fast forward to the me writing Ben Seat, having the the uh, video movie idea in my head. Um, that was the moment I was like, okay, if I'm going to have a dog in this video, it's going to be my dog. Originally, it was going to be the puppy. It took us two years to piece together the video and make it right. So Jack's the middle dog in the video. But that's that's what sent me over the edge of like, all right, I'm getting a dog finally. And you put him on the back of the record to show what? Um, well, do- Cowboys and Dogs, for whatever reason, was the theme of this record, probably because I was addressing, you know, my dad, who's on the cover. Um, and then Jack was on the back. Jack, I-, I think I mentioned Dog like four or five times in this record. I'll get off it on the next one, but that's where I'm at in life. I- this dog, he came into my life. I don't. I wouldn't say saved my life or anything, but he's made my life a lot better, and he's made me more capable of loving someone Bro, and, and being I mean, loved. Absolutely, did it for me. My dog did the same thing. Yeah, people think I'm crazy when I say that. Yeah, I and think when no. I said amen, I was just, I was just a re- visceral reaction to me going. Hey, I felt that. Yeah. Why do you think that about you? Um. I don't. I don't like the I don't like the idea of someone loving me, and I don't know why. I. I think I I think it stems from my dad passing away, um, to where I haven't had that in 15 years now. So I'm like, ah, I'm good. Plus, you you put on this front like you're all tough. Plus, you have fame start to come into the picture, so you don't really know who to trust. Um, and I just don't like the idea. It makes me uncomfortable. So it's funny when I'm that tough guy or I'm putting on the act, and then all of a sudden rolling around on the floor with Jack. And he has a thing about it. There's no judgment. There's no there's no falseness to it. It's just you and your dog rolling around on the floor and, and me like talking in a higher pitched voice that I'm used to, that I'll ever mm-hmm. talk to anybody. So I think first it's allowed me to let myself be loved by something um or someone. And then that can flip. I hopefully that, you know, allows me to flip it into loving somebody at some point. And oh. I'm not saying I don't love it. Like I love my mom, I love my brother. Yeah, yeah. I, I- Right, but a like a romantic trust, non blood love that you don't right that you have to work at. You have to work because your at. brother's gonna be your brother regardless. You right. may get into a fight, but he, he's always gonna be your brother. Yeah. You how old are you? Thirty seven. Okay, so I didn't I didn't get married. Till I was thirty nine, and never been engaged. Was never in a serious relationship. And in my vows, what I said is like the hardest thing I have to do is learn to be loved. Be loved. Yeah. Wow. And my dog Dusty, who I had for thirteen years, like I would practice because I did. I love that dog. I never told. Anybody I loved him my whole life. Yeah. I didn't say, I just didn't. I didn't know, I, I didn't, I didn't know how to, but that dog, yeah. I would tell him all the time. Like, I mean, it makes me emotional yeah. to think about it. I was just like, I would say, man, I love you, I love, and it's the only, that, I wouldn't even, I couldn't even say love in recreating a situation that I didn't say it. We were yeah. talking about, and they'd be on the show, be like, well, what if you, if you met, how would you say it? I'd be like, oh, I can't. I live, yeah. that dog, like almost, like trained me to when it finally happened. Yeah. And it wasn't easy. Wow. But when it finally happened with my wife now, it was like, this feels different. I can't piss this away. I know I'm capable because I love that animal before he died. Yeah. So when you said that, I was like, dang, I, f- like, I felt that more than anything. Yeah. Because that was a big part of my life. Yeah. It's a 13-year-old dog who adopted from a puppy mill. And that <laughs> changed it. And that, that, that changed it all. Are you... I mean, I'm assuming you want a family. Yeah, I do, for sure. Um, I'm in a place right now where I'm extremely lonely a lot, but I'm okay with it. It's not like I'm in this depressed state. I just, I'm living in it, man. And and, and I I also understand that it, a dog isn't enough. Like, I don't want to be the guy that's 50 years old just with him and his dog. Um, I But I've earned it. Like, I've earned the lonely, uh, but, and I'm doing it on purpose for now. Because I just feel like that's what I need to do for myself. Um, and and also, I think it's going to take something that extreme to get me out of this place of, of – or get me into the place of wanting to really be with somebody, one person. Um, because I'll tell you one thing. I was thinking about – I think about this all the time. But, like, going down the road of a lot of women, 
no matter how tough you can sound in front of your buddies and the ones that say don't ever get married and all this, it leads you to extreme depression. And I don't, I don't know all the details of why, but it leads you to a very, very dark place. And, and it leads you to a lot of sex with a zero intimacy. And then the more you do it, the more it leads you to just wanting to be alone. And it's a dark place to be. Whenever you're talking about being lonely, but what's, what's great about what you're saying is, because I went to a lot of therapy, I went to a, a couple's counselor by myself. And she had <laughs> never had anybody do that. But I found one. And I was like, yeah. I, need, I need help because I need to understand what I love. Yeah. And, and when it hits me, I need to know how to not run from it. Yeah. And because uh-huh. my wife, unlike anybody else, strong, smart, bullheaded, She's the only person that I don't like to argue with because I can outsmart. I feel like I can outsmart anybody. Yeah. I don't like it because I don't. She, I can't. Like she's, and it really pisses me off. And you can't manipulate. Her. I can't. I can't. Right. Yeah. And so I think I would have run because it was so strong. My feelings were for, were so strong so quickly. But I went to a couples counselor, and I was like, I'm very lonely, but I'm not going to settle, and I'll be lonely forever <laughs> instead of settling. And she was like, That's the freaking healthiest place you can be. Damn. So that's exactly where I am. Damn. That's that's because you're not that's trying to, you're not trying to, to fill a void. With something quick and easy. Right. You're going, it's a void, but it's going to be a void until we figure it out, like, yeah. long term. And then and then I'll do it. I will go. I will f- try to fill that void knowing it's not going to work, and then it doesn't work, and then you just end up using somebody else. And that's a shitty way to live. You're also very self-aware, though, now, too, which yeah. I think is massive growth. So this is interesting. I, I sent this to, his name's Jim. He, uh, he wrote a thing called The Blue Book, which I read every morning. Um, I sent this to him a couple days ago. And it was just a quote that I, um, that I was reading in a book. And let me just pull it up where whatever I sent to Jim, because it's between it's there's a difference between self aware, and yeah, insight is easy, change is hard, and that's that's what it, that was a one small quote I, I sent him. And I said I'm in the insight phase, which is so with so much unwillingness to act on it, but I want to change that because. And I'm not unwilling to act on it. I know I have the insight now. Now I've got to take the action. And you can't take the action without the insight. Right. And if you don't walk yeah. the ladder in the rungs in order, you'll fall off the ladder. You yeah. can't jump five rungs up yeah. because you'll eventually you'll miss and mm-hmm. you'll fall back to the bottom. Yeah. But now I at least have the, the foundation. The foundation's yeah. there. Um, I've still got a – I've been thinking about going back and seeing the lady I was seeing just because – why not? What? There's no bad that's going to come from that. Um, it's like I. And then when I start going down this lonely dark hole, it's like, okay, you've been here before. Calm down. Like, don't start sliding back into the mindset of like you have to be alone. Like you've been here before. Slow down, chill for a minute, and you, then you can start pulling yourself back out of it. What do you think about kids? I love kids. I want. I want kids. Um, that's that's uh, something I get to see with my brothers. They have my oldest brother has a niece and a or daughter and a son. And my niece and nephew. My middle brother has a son who's almost two or three, I think three, and uh, he's about to have a second one. So it's cool to get to see it um, as an uncle, um, but it also makes me want it even more. Um, I just don't want to wake up and be fifty five and have all this stuff to myself. Um, I want to be able to start something that's bigger than me. Which would be, you know, obviously I would like to meet a woman first and marry her and have kids, um, for sure. That'd be that. That would be the ultimate dream for me that I haven't done yet in life. Way down yonder is the tour, and it's also the next single. Mike, can you play just a bit of that? Yep. Way down yonder where the outlaws wanna, you can feel that thunder in your bones. Oh, will you play it again? Um, chop that a little bit. Yes. Yeah, Peter's freezing up. Way down yonder where the outlaws wanna You can feel that thunder in your bones Ripping hot dog runners on the moonlight Pretty swampy kind of, yeah. yeah, I mean The reason we chose that as the first single I think there's better songs on the record um, But I don't know, we've chose all these love songs and stuff For singles and it's like, that's not even me Let's show something that's actually me And very different Very, very different than anything I've ever done um, and that's why we started it with that. But then if you dive into the record and it's actually working now, it's like, God, finally, we got a song that's streaming. Uh, the streaming is kind of a good way to gauge mm-hmm. 
because it's not even at radio yet. But, um, yeah, we wanted to, like, if we're going to show that we're doing something different, let's really show it. And that's why we chose that one first. But then it's it's a unique record where I don't know if there's anything that just raises its hand. Um, or does everything raise its hand, right? If or does everything. Right. Cause, Could Bench Seat be a single at radio? I have no idea. It's very different. And it's, like, it's, you're talking about songs. Like, I played guitar on that, and I set the um, the tempo. <laughs> as opposed to Fred, who's one of the best drummers in town. So like, there's parts that are clearly not in time, as well as other songs. But it, who cares? I don't know. I just, something's going to raise its hand, I think. Um, this is a weird record for me, because I think it's setting a whole new tone for my career. And it didn't have a, it had a really good first week, but it didn't have like a, like I'm sitting here like, well, why is it not as big as Morgan Wallen? Well, because Morgan Wallen's the biggest artist on the planet. Like, I've learned, don't compare yourself to that. Um, also, this is a whole new thing. It's going to take people time to even trust it. And it's a whole new you from something else that isn't a new thing yeah. that they have to learn this new version of yeah. you as well. And learn if it's, do they, like, is this guy even real? Yeah, it's true. Um, but this is the most me, like, that, that's, I'm not worried about that because there's going to be a deluxe that comes out. It's going to be like, yes. And then there's going to be another record that comes out and says, yes. Like, guys, it's not going backwards to eyes on you. Eyes on You is pretty good. <laughs> I actually like Eyes on You as yeah. a song. I've always had this battle with producers of, hey, why don't you do what Jay Joyce would do? It's like, because you're not Jay Joyce. Now I get it. But right. I, I push producers too hard sometimes to try to do something that's not them. Um, And now I don't do that. Now it's just like, don't do that. I actually worked with Jay on a song going into this album, and he helped shape this whole record in a way. And and uh, Because it was cool to get to work with him. But it was also cool to see how it worked, get behind the scenes, and then also see how Oscar works and know, like, yeah, he's just as good. He just doesn't have the accolades yet, but he's just as good of a producer. And he's hungrier. Urban legend, I don't know how urban it is. Uh, let's Your football career. <laughs> I hear everything from you were a star running back to a linebacker. Wide no, no, I'm talking about what I hear. People, it's an urban legend oh. at this point. Like it's all you've played every position, <laughs> sometimes multiple at once. You've been kicker. I mean, <laughs> like, what's the real story? Yeah. Uh, that's, I didn't know that was, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I was a linebacker, um, at, at Carolina, North Carolina. I got to the point back half of sophomore year. I was a really good player going into my junior year. I was like, okay, this kid can play in the NFL. Um, got hurt first game, snapped my ankle. Was first done. game? First of your, game. Of yeah. Your junior year. Of like, it's the your, year. It's the your year. season. Yeah. Like second quarter. You remember the play? Yeah. It was a quarterback was running. I look at the film and it look it's different than I remember in my head, but obviously the film's the truth. But um, yeah, I hit the quarterback and like it was just my ankle snapped. You hit the quarterback whenever you're. Yeah, we were kind of we kind of just hit at a weird angle. He was running. We hit face. You know, helmet. Who was helmet. it? You remember? Uh, no, we number seven for James Madison. Okay, so we you, were beating the hell out of him. Did you know it was like your leg was over then? Yeah, I knew my season was over. Thought I broke my ankle. Went up at halftime. The lady's like, give me a thumbs up around the corner. And I'm just like, no way. There's no way it's not. That's not a sprain. So in the in the shower of all places after the game, I'm like, okay, I'm going to put some weight on it. If it's just a sprain, who cares? As soon as I did it, the tendon on the back snapped all the way to the front of my foot. And then the doctor doctors come in and snap it back in place. And Oof. So I got surgery on that. I'm trying to come back my senior year. Immediately, like, I, I'm just not the same guy. It's just Physically, I couldn't run the same. Um, and then that going into that senior year was when my dad passed away. So in May with the injury, do you think that a lot of my friends are athletes? They like say they tear a hamstring or they have an ACL injury. It's not the same, but they also aren't the same mentally where they're like every time they put it on mm -hmm. for a long time, they're like, yeah. I don't want to put too much on it because it'll happen again. They've already been through it once. Was that happening with you at all? Yeah. Especially knowing like that my, uh, whatever the groove is in your ankle is it was just more shallow than any other ankle so in my mind i'm like okay if this one's holding up because mm -hmm. it still was like clicking it was weird still does today i'm sitting there like okay well what, am i gonna do it to my right one now so mentally you're not the same physically i couldn't run the same and then on top of that the kid that backed me up i was a senior at that point he was a sophomore he had an average year you know he was a freshman he didn't he was just figuring it out um, but he was becoming a really good player too. So I was just all jacked up and my dad had just died. So I'm just like, I was not there. It sucks because I know what could have been. 
because I know what, how I was playing football, and I was good. And then, like, four or five of my backups on the team ended up going to the NFL. Um, this kid was a second round, a first round draft pick. Um, and, and but it did teach me a lot. Like I look back on that. Same thing with right right now. Same thing with like my whole career. FGL Sam Hunt. I was like, damn, I'm jealous. I want to do that. So I joined it and I stopped making stuff that's true to me. Um, and I learned now. Okay, do what you wish you'd have done in college, which was that whole year. I wish I would have taken a lot more time to sit down with the kid. His name is Bruce Carter, um, and help him become a better player that year because that would have made me better um and it would also made our team better but I was selfishly like nope I don't want to make him better because I want to get back my senior year and I want to get back my starting role the starting role was never going to happen for me again I wasn't the same player but it, I was I was bad I was being selfish were you depressed uh Cause, cause yeah but your dad died so that I mean that's a whole different traumatic but about football yeah. was there a specific depression where it's like I put all this time into it and now it's over or was it just overridden by your dad's death uh before my dad died i was i think i was just sad yeah i was pissed off um i don't even know if i was depressed i was just mad that my season got taken as soon as my dad died yeah that started a depression that lasted all the way to 2014 or 15 um 16 17 before i really got out of it fully and i say fully like i'm always going to deal with it sure. uh, there's definitely days but I, like i said i know i've been in that hole i know how to get out of it but I sat down in 2013 after my mom wrote me this long letter over Christmas realizing that I was just out. I was not there. I was there, but I wasn't. And uh, that was when I was having success with Cruz and Ready, Set, Roll, and I was miserable. I remember writing in my journal before she wrote me this letter, I wrote, I no longer want to be alive. That's an awful place to be. And she wrote me this letter. I read it. Like, oh, called her immediately. Like, mom, you're right. I'll get help. Um... And I sat down with this guy. Um, his name's Al. He's the best. I still talk to him today. And he sits there and listens to me talk for five, six minutes. And then he just looks at me and laughs. He's just like, yeah, you're depressed. And I was pissed. Like, no, I'm not. It took me that long to even realize I was depressed. Um, but, yeah, it was my first time dealing with depression. So yeah. why would I know what it looks like? I didn't know. I, I'm not depressed. That's what – because I was functioning. Like, I was still getting up. I was having success even. I was touring. Um, I was actually functioning. In my mind, depressed people stay in bed all day. That's not the truth. Um, Kyle Jacobs, we just lost him. I had no idea. And that's uh, – I haven't talked to Lee yet, but uh, he, uh, yeah, I mean, you just don't know. Right. NASCAR, a lot of urban legends there. What would you do? Uh, I was a a jack man for, like, what we were was the team that they brought in. They brought in one team in 2010 or 9. Or I don't know what a jack man is, by the way. You got to yeah, okay. talk to me like I'm a The guy, when the too. car comes in, he puts a jack oh, on Oh, literally puts and, a jack guy Yeah, and jacks the car up. And then you, I was a jack man first, and I went to a rear tire carrier, which has got the imprints the, or uh, inserts the the rear Tire and wheel. That's a, it's just a like a whole in process. the pit. In the pit, and it's you like, do all that in like thirteen dang, seconds. Got yeah. it. Yeah. So they brought in like nine or ten of us to see if the ex athletes could do the stops faster than the you know the old timers in the shop, and it worked immediately. Like yeah, once we learned what we were doing, we were doing stops faster. Now you look down pit road, it's all ex ex football players, ex baseball, whatever. Strength and hand eye coordination, which is imperative to that job. Young athletes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. And it made perfect sense, and it worked. But 2009, I, we were the young guns. We were staying in hotels. We were um, just a trial period. That year, we won a championship with Jimmy, but we were the guys like glue and tires. We were nobodies. A couple of the guys got moved up. I started pitting for a guy named Ryan Newman, uh, doing some stuff for Jimmy Johnson on race day, which was he won another championship in 2010. Um, I was never the guy that went over the wall for Jimmy on race day. We were getting there. Like, I was about to be. And then I Is over the wall, like, starting? Just started. Got it. Just started, yeah. 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 And uh, so, but we were the re best race team in the world. We won two championships, and we were the guys, the next guys in line. And some of the guys had already gone up. I was half-assing everything because I was, uh, was kind of miserable. I was miserable. Just lost football. Just lost my dad. Got this new job. I'm living in a hotel. I'm lost in life. And I just started writing songs when my dad passed away. So I'm like, 
man, I really want to go to, and I just visited Brian. Uh, I actually got in a fight. I got I hit it one of our crew guys in the face. I was just a, like physical, yeah, physically yeah. smoked him. Um, I wish I smoked somebody one time just so I had a story. I actually didn't even hit him that hard. Like I, I, I just it was just a I reaction. Sm- I just wish I smoked somebody at one point to have the story. <laughs> just I just, yeah, I'm just trying not to get smoked my whole life. But I got suspended for that, and I came and visited Brian. That was my first visit to Nashville ever, and that was when they were like, "Hey, we're, we'll meet Tyler later. We're gonna go play some songs at the Hotel Indigo here." And uh, I Tyler was to my right, Brian was to my left, and that was my first time really singing into a microphone. So that was when I fell in love with Nashville, which made me hate Charlotte and the NASCAR job even more. I finally was starting to get really good at the NASCAR job. Like, okay, you're about to be up. And that was when Survivor happened randomly. So in my mind, the TV show, in my mind, I was like, okay, that's a way for me to go, maybe make some money, and then I can come move to Nashville. Oh, so it was like the, the, your pivot out, your natural yeah. pivot out. Instead of quitting the job because it was too good of a job to quit. Like, that's the type of stuff I'm thinking. I can't quit this job. My dad raced. Um, he would love that I'm in racing right now. I can't quit this job to go do music. That's not, when not, did you start playing guitar? Because you say you're writing songs, but were you a musical kid at all? I started in 20, 21. How old uh, were you? 21 years old. Uh, oh, yeah, 21. Uh, yeah, I was 21. And I learned to play guitar, but I was like, I wasn't. That's late. That's late. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought. Like, why'd you buy a guitar? Like, what led you at 21 to buy a guitar? Ben Lemming, uh, offensive lineman at Carolina. He had a Martin 814 CE because he was a huge Dave Matthews fan. He'd play Dave. He'd sing. He'd play while I would sing in the dorm room. Could you sing? Had you had you always been able okay. to sing a little bit? Yeah. I wasn't great. And I'm still, like, I'm not, I'm no Stapleton. <laughs> but who, I got to. Who a, is, yeah, right? Exactly. But he was the one. He was like, dude, you should go to, or you should uh, be a country music singer. You're pretty good. And I don't know how he worded it, but. In my mind, it was the equivalent of you should go be an astronaut. <laughs> and, and then I kept learning songs. Where'd then, you buy the guitar? Did you go to the music store? I went to a random store in Asheville, bought a Seagull guitar, which my brother has now. Um, and then I wanted, I'd be in class like Googling Martin guitars. I, I don't know why I wanted a Martin. I think because Dave Matthews may have played one. Um, so I... I showed it to my dad. My dad made me sit and play. The only time he's ever seen me play, which is cool that he got to. Um, he made me sit in front of him and my mom in the living room in their house in North Carolina and play like four or five songs. He said, I'm not going to buy you the nice Martin that you want unless you do this. And I did it. So he bought me this Mar- uh, the Martin that I still play today. That's awesome. Yeah. It's like, and, and that was another thing. Looking back, I was so out of who I am. Um, and what got me into music in the first place from 2000, when I started to 2020, when I made this record, like I wasn't even using that guitar on the road. Now that's the only guitar I use or not the only one, but the main guitar I use, I was just so in that locked in that tracks pop style of music that, uh, I wasn't even playing that guitar that my dad got me. I just lost so much touch Mm -hmm. of who I was. Um, but it's okay. It all led to now. That's like the main guitar I use, and I'll it'll, 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 forever. It'll always be. How did you l- learn to play? Uh, ben taught me a G chord in the dorm, then a D, and then a like E minor and C, which is interesting because that's the chord progression of Cruz. <laughs> and it's also the chords that I probably learned too because they were the easiest. Yeah, it's just you know, it's just yeah. um, when did you, okay? When did you start to do bar chords? Because that, oh. that that's when it's like. That's when you're really. That's hit. when it's like you're that learning was, to play guitar. That first year, I, I and I was terrible at them. But I remember looking at an F, like mm. I'm never going to learn the F. Never going to get my finger over the whole thing. What? And then the, yeah, 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 same. No chance I'm yeah. learning the F chord, and I'm still not a big bar chord guy. But I lo- I'm more of like a move the cable. Yeah, I'm capable of the crap out of everything. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just you got to. I don't know. You got to be Ed Sheeran or something to do all that stuff. Um, but that year I learned. I got better. When my dad died, I wrote my first song about him. It's called Larger Than Life, um, which is actually his headstone, his, his tombstone. Um, what What is? It's Larger Than Life, Daniel L. Rice. Oh, got it. Then it's the dates and John sixteen twenty two, which is, uh, now, now's your time of grief, but I'll see you again. Um, and you rejoice and no man will take away your joy. But um, I wrote the first song about him. Second song was, which makes perfect sense. I was in this party mode of uh wrote, wrote the song about my dad then i went to georgia with my buddy that the about the Bincy's about um we went to georgia um 
hung out with a girl there, a group of girls there, and, and wrote a song called Georgia Girl. And I was in the back half of my senior year. Football was done. And I was partying for the first time in college. For first time ever in college because I was playing football, you know. I'd lost that identity of the football player. Now it's like I'm going nuts. So I started writing those songs. And then Charlotte, same thing, I'm partying. Moved to Nashville, you're partying because it's a party town. And which makes perfect sense when you look at from 2010 to 2019 or really 17. 17, I started cooling off a little bit on it. But why all those songs were that bro country party thing? That's where I was in life and that's what I was doing. Why would I not sing about it? So it's kind of, and I never thought about that until literally right now. All right, Chase Rice on Instagram, Chase Rice Music on TikTok, which by the way, you kind of kill it over there. Wasn't really expecting to be killing it over there, I'll be honest with you. I don't even do you it. You kind of kill it over there. <laughs> I mean, I'll do something like, if it's music, I was like, I just want it to be about the music. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because I don't, I don't do that. I don't, I've never been on TikTok, but I will promote, promote the music on there. I mean, no, you, you do, like again, you kill it on TikTok. <laughs> I just didn't expect didn't to go over there and be, and you have a ton of followers because even like Jake Owen, like over the Jake and I have been friends. He's the first person I knew here because Andy Roddick and Jake, who was Josh back in the day, he was my friend Josh, uh-huh. is in Nashville. When you go, I'll set you up. You guys will be friends or you'll at least he'll kind of point you in directions. So yeah. I could get here and Josh is now Jake. And Jake and I always knew each other, but you know, when he was drinking, is tough because it was he was inconsistent. Yeah. And that was tough for me. We didn't see each other often. I never, never knew who I was going to get. But over the last couple to few years, we've become really close again. Yeah. Um, our wives are close. Jake and I are super tight. Like, I love them. Yeah. I don't say that about many folks. but And so Jake hates TikTok. He, won't, he wouldn't get on it. He's like, I hate. And I was like, yo, Chase has got like 400,000 followers, and he's not doing anything corny over there. Yeah. Like, I won't do it's, it. just a, it's just a place to put more stuff mm-hmm. that you can find more people. It can help song stream. I, I think Zach Bryan. He's well. He's a YouTube guy that moved YouTube. over to TikTok okay. and then blew up on TikTok. But yes, it's all the same though. My point is, it's all the same. Yeah. If there's a stage, you can be on it. Yeah. And always be there. And there's a way. Like I told him from the beginning, I'm not doing the dances. I'm not doing any of that. <laughs> it has to be about the music. And, and that's, that's what Zach does. And Zach's like, you'd think the opposite of that. So, but it's huge for him. Huge. So, but it's also the main thing is that he makes good music. So, that's your team does a good job then. Yeah, because you're kind of killing it over there. I I just I didn't want another app to get on. I I can't, I'm on my phone enough mm-hmm. staring at useless stuff. I'm like, nope, I, I'm not doing it. But yeah, I'm not. Hell yeah, use the use the stage. It's another stage to promote the music. And I mean, that's the game right now. It's the game part of it. You can use that to get streaming. Yeah, I mean, that's, and it's huge. Mm-hmm. It, like I had Ride blow up randomly a couple couple years ago when. It, all I did was hold the phone and reacted to a girl that was talking about Ride. It exploded, and Ride went to, like, number one on iTunes. What just happened? And I I hope that happens with something other than Ride because I'm sick of that. <laughs> that wasn't even supposed to be my song in the first place. But this record, I don't know how it's going to explode. I don't know if it ever will. I think it will, but I don't, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I think it will because... At the end, I think good quality music does punch through. New album came out in February. I guess we're wrapping up February. When's this? Is this next week? It'll air a couple weeks. Okay, so it'll be, it's yeah. March, early March right yeah. now. Um, it's great. It's great. I mean, it really is. I Hate Cowboys and All Dogs Go to Hell. And I asked you about the title and the song, I Hate Cowboys. It's You have to hear it to yeah. kind of understand it. But you hate Cowboys for a good reason because you're kind of yeah. jealous of them. Well, you're just jealous because yeah. he was better than you. Yeah. And then All Dogs Go to Hell is not that. I mean, it's all a web of lies like. I don't, you're just sarcastically saying, I don't even miss you. Yeah, right. I'll right. always go to hell. Yeah. You, uh, check it out. Uh, dude, we've been here for over an hour. Yeah. Like, I feel like I got to know you better here than I ever have. And I know you and I haven't always, I don't want to say not gotten along. We just never ran to, we just were never near. And then it was we like, never talk. Ever. Yeah. And I was probably always like, he's bigger than me and better looking. So I'm going to stay away. You know, <laughs> you know how that is. Like, he gets girls. I've, I've got a lot of ideas from other people or people have a lot of preconceived notions of who I am that are so off, but I think they're so off because of how I hope have presented myself in the past. Like, and now I'm just not doing that anymore. I, there's good people. Man. Same. I mean, same with yeah. me, right? Like I came into this place for years and was just like, let's burn everything down. Yeah. It was all, it was out of insecurity. Yeah. Like I'm going to burn every single thing down in this mm-hmm. town and they're going to respect me and they'll have no choice. Yeah. And then now it's like, here I am 10 years later and I, I still have that and that drive, but it's not the same. And I'm like, man, I didn't have to be bull in the China shop. Yeah. I, I was just so scared and impo- I had imposter syndrome yeah. and how uh-huh. I how I faked it was I'm bigger, smarter, 
uh, smarter, funnier, and I'm going to, if you come at me, I'm going to come at you 10 times as hard. Yeah. And I wish I wouldn't have done that now. Yeah. And me too. And that's, and Jake was a big part of that. I, we were at his party over Christmas and he was just like, cause you made the joke, uh, about me on, uh, your comedy thing. And immediately my first reaction is screw that. I hate that guy. But I thought about it too. I was like, he didn't lie. <laughs> You didn't say anything wrong. Well, you did ask me, you go, did I open a show for you? I was like, yeah, one in Austin. You're like, okay, Austin. never mind. Then you weren't lying. You didn't lie about anything. <laughs> so what am I mad about? Right. Um, and I just trust Jake, man. And and if you're buddies with Jake, you're a good dude. He doesn't put up with anything outside of that. Well, I asked Jake. I said, hey, I ain't going to put this out. I did this joke about Chase. And, I was like, and he's like, he won't like it at first, but Chase is a cool dude. Yeah. Like, he'll get it. <laughs> and like, he may not like it at first, but... You should, because I went to Jake, yeah. and I don't ever ask anybody about jokes, because I'm just like, you're gonna put it out there, it. let it live, and then uh, he was like, no, Chase, because I knew you and him were also friends, yeah. and I was like, he goes, just put it out, it'll be fine, and then you were at the over Jake's, and he's like, hey, Chase is here, and I was like, well, uh, cool, I'll talk to you. He's worried. He's like, you worried? <laughs> you told me I could do the joke, man. <laughs> what should I be worried what about? What should I be worried about? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> and then you and I talked for probably, <laughs> like probably for a half an hour. Just you and I just stood over uh -huh. and talked, and I was like. Oh, man, that was good. That was, I, I really enjoyed that. My like, manager texted me after we were on your show last week, or a couple weeks ago, and he uh, he was like, wait a minute. Are you and Bobby boys now? <laughs> he was even shocked. I was like, yeah, man. If you talk to people face-to-face. -face, That's what I was saying earlier. It's eyeballs man, on eyeballs. You you quickly. It's just something's yeah. different. And I, like you've even said, you're different. I'm different than I've been in the last ever. And you just grow up and you. there's no reason to have enemies. And if you do... I don't. I don't know. I just. I, I think at the end of the day, both sides would just get along better if they just talk. And there's no reason to have enemies in this town and life. It's like just talk to people, man. And you and I would. I, I wouldn't. We weren't enemies. We just didn't know each other. Yeah, we were just like, eh, it's not for me. Right. We, we weren't enemies at all. No. But I was like, eh, you know, I'll pass. And you were like, eh, I don't want to have to smoke them. So I was like, thank God, I don't want to smoke. <laughs> I've always wanted to smoke one person. I don't want to get smoked. <laughs> I right, follow Chase on Instagram and TikTok. The album's great. And the tour is way down yonder, right? Same. Mm -hmm. And you're doing some shows with Jelly Roll, too. I saw that. Yeah, that was, that was cool that he asked me to do that. So uh, you guys follow up, Chase. And, uh, dude, great great time. We yeah. did way over an hour. I appreciate how generous you were with stories and yeah. vulnerability. And um, it was just one, I think people are going to see a whole new side of you here. Long form. One of my friends texted me today. His exact thing was, I'm just going to read this to you. He yeah. said, long form media is not good for liars. Because they get caught constantly. Yeah. We just did an hour and a half. This I feel like this was a great hour and a half Dang. for me and you, and for you, and for this project. Long form media not good for somebody who's not being inauthentic. And I it, think this was very authentic. Yeah, it's it's, and I'm just trying to continue to be better as a dude. I'm working through a lot of stuff still, but um, it's also easy to be that way when I know that you're not going to sit here and judge me for it. And at the same time, if there are people out there who are gonna. They're probably not the people for you. Like right. if they don't promote or like help you be yourself, they're the wrong people to be around. All right. And that's what made it easy. That's what made so it easy you. for me too, man. All right, there is Chase Rice. <laughs>